Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 146 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. Happy New Year, everybody. Yes. Happy 2022. Yeah. it's, it's When we started saying 2021, it sounded like science fiction. That hasn't changed for me. <laughs> no. Now we just have a lot more twos in it. 2022. Uh, Hopefully two is a good number. Yes, indeed. So we have some thank yous. We got some donations from three people. Aunt Ellen, Mary A, and Julie Z. Thank you all so much for that kindness. We really appreciate you. We also got a new Patreon. Rebecca joined our Patreon crew. Hey, welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going to do a truncated episode at the beginning. We're not going to do all of our segments because at the end... We're going to have our buddy Russell on from Ink and Paper Blog, the booktuber, to carry on our annual tradition of each of us sharing our top 10 reads of 2021. Indeed, I can't wait. I really literally cannot wait <laughs> to hear what everyone's favorites are. We're going to start with currently reading. What are you reading, Chris? I'm currently reading a book that I had started in the late spring, I believe it was, and I put it down because the semester just got to be too much for me to read this. It's nonfiction. It's Rebecca Harding Davis, A Life Among Writers by Sharon M. Harris, who was one of my professors um, back at the University of Nebraska a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca Harding Davis was a very popular, influential 19th century writer. She's best known for probably Life in the Iron Mills, which brought to light a lot of the hardship of what the workers were experiencing and she wrote in a very realistic way. So she's one of the early practitioners of realism. The book is an excellent biography. It's a cradle to the grave biography, as they say. And it's the first full length biography of her life. And not much was known before Sherry Harris dug into the archives and letters of Davis and other people. She lived such an amazing life. One of the things I like about this biography, and I'll talk about it more next episode, I realize we're trying to keep our front part of this episode a little bit on the shorter side, but reading it, you learn not only about Rebecca Harding Davis, but also what publishing was like in the 19th century from the writer's perspective and how she had to negotiate things with all of these different magazines and journals and editors and personalities. You yeah. learn a lot about yeah. that as well as her life and her writing mainly. The main focus is her writing, I think. Do you know what inspired Sherry to be interested in Rebecca Harding Davis? She's a very influential scholar in pre-20th century American women writers. I think she might have even written her dissertation on Davis. Okay. And she's written other works about Davis and a slew of other authors and movements within earlier American literary periods. And I think she's just somebody who deserves to have a full-length biography for one. Mm -hmm. Sherry was really influential in the early wave of recovering American women writers who were so popular in the 19th century and earlier, but who were dismissed by the literary establishment in the early 20th century when it became Boys Club. Right. She's just somebody who deserved a full length biography. And then no one really knew the extent of her connection with the movers and shakers of her day. Mm. Yeah. And she had a fantastically egalitarian marriage with her husband. He was also a writer. I think he started as a lawyer, he became an editor, he was a writer. And they just really supported one another. He kind of vibed off of her writing success. So like one of the flows that they had, her work started to be published in a new magazine and she'd start the relationship. But then shortly after, a story by the husband would follow, you know, so <laughs> yeah. that kind he of benefited. Thing. Right, yes. exactly. And then their children were very well-known writers as well. Mm. More to that. I've been reading an hour again every morning, which has been wonderful. My brain has finally relaxed after the end of the semester. So I'm, I'm planning on finishing this within a couple of days. Great. Well, I'm reading a new short story collection that is coming out the day that this episode drops on January 4th. It's called Seasonal Work by Laura Lippman. It came with a lot of great marketing materials because this is the 25th anniversary of her publishing career. Wow. She's very well known for the Tess Monahan series, 
Have you read any of those? I think I did because I remember when she first started mm-hmm. and, and just how popular the series became. So I'm, I'm certain I probably did. How is that for a lame answer? No, I believe you. I mean, Baltimore Blues, which is the first in the series, came out in 97. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a minute ago. They show all the different highlights of her career. The series has 13 books in it, and Tess Monahan is a PI. And then Laura Lippman also has standalone novels as well. I've read Wild Lake, and I've read Lady in the Lake. Oh, yeah. yeah. I totally read that one. That was one for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then I had Sunburn, which was 2018, but I haven't gotten to that one. But anyway, it's a short story collection with a set of stories, including some that have been published before, some new ones as well, including a novella that is about a couple that's holed up in their house during a global pandemic, and they're getting by by watching old episodes of Columbo. And then they decide on a whim to get on a dating app to see who they would match each other with. (laughs) And something goes awry with that. I've just barely started it. But the way it's marketed is that if you're interested in fierce women, this is a collection for you. So super excited. Again, it's called Seasonal Work by Laura Lippman. Thank you to William Morrow for our copy. And it is available now. Very cool. That looks good. I'd love to check that one out too. Yeah. And I like the marketing copy. I mean, one of the things that they sent is legal size. Yes. Piece of paper (laughs) with a color thumbnail of each book's cover. And then it looks like a little synopsis of the book. Mm hmm. And all the awards that it won, because many of them have won awards. Yeah, so it's like two pages, front and back, legal size. So that is a lot of books. Yeah, and then they have an interview with her, which is great, another set of materials, and then marketing material on the book itself. Good publicist. (laughs) (laughs) What did you just read, Chris? Well, I had a DNF. After I read Garlic and the Vampire that I love so much, that graphic novel, I thought, ooh, I'm going to try reading a Hardy Boys book because I loved the Hardy Boys when I was a kid. My sister read Nancy Drew, so I had to read something different, and I went for the Hardy Boys, and I was a tomboy, so I guess it made sense. I picked up Mystery of the Whale Tattoo because I saw somebody say it was partially in Mystic, Connecticut. Uh, I couldn't get very far into it. I mean... (laughs) (laughs) The stereotypes were, oh my gosh, I just couldn't really do it. So I thought, don't make yourself do it. Just remember the series fondly and move on. Right. Yeah. Some things don't hold up over time. Yeah. I mean, I remember reading one in a day when I was little Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking like, I'm such a big girl. Like I'm a badass because I just (laughs) finished this whole book in one day, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So how about you? I finished The Silent Woods by Kimmy Cunningham Grant. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I talked a lot about it in the last episode. I do just want to say a reminder this has to do with a father who's raising his daughter off the grid in the mountains of Appalachia. And the thing I will say about it is the ending really surprised me. Really? Yeah, it was one of those books where you thought, oh, I know how this is going to end. I mentioned that it was a butt clencher. I'm like, this isn't going to end well. But the ending really surprised me. And I really loved all of the nature in the book. It was beautifully written. Again, These Silent Woods by Kimmy Cunningham Grant. So it, it surprised you in a good way, it sounds like. In a good like. way. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, I did finish one book since the last time we talked. And it's a novella slash short story from Tor.com. They sent us an advanced reader copy. Thank you so much for that. And this was Servant Madge by Kate Elliott. She's a pretty prolific writer. She's been writing for about 30 years and has several fantasy sci-fi series. And this is about a young girl named Felion is her name, and she's a lamplighter, which means she can make light out of magic with her own hands and shape it so people can hold it if necessary. It starts in a place where she's basically an indentured servant slash enslaved person more than, you know, a servant, it sounds like, because there was this big civil war between the monarchists and the rebellion. So she was enslaved after her parents were executed. So she's making light for these people and then cleaning the latrines. So it has a little bit of like a medieval vibe Mm, and then a magical vibe. 
She, one night, has a visitor who asks her to join him on this quest. She doesn't really have a choice. (laughs) (laughs) She does, but she doesn't, you know. And uh, I won't say anything more than that other than for this being just a short story, it set such a wonderful world. It really was vivid to me. She's off on this quest now with this group of people who are traveling to an area to help rescue some people when a new baby is born that the leader of the other side wants to kill Mm. because it's a baby with special powers. And I want to talk about it so much, but I don't want to give any spoilers because cool (laughs) stuff happens. All right. So read it, people, and then get on Goodreads and talk to Chris about it. Yes, yes, please. (laughs) Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I want to read more from Kate Elliott. And again, that was Servant Mage. It's Mm M-A-G-E. I think that's Mage. Mage, yeah. Yeah. For magic, I'm not really sure. That's pretty impressive. I mean, short stories are so hard to write anyway, but then when you're creating a whole new world in a short story... Or a novella, I should mm-hmm. say. So that's that's impressive. Yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I should note that Kate Elliott writes sci-fi, fantasy, and romance for both adults and YA. And I think this one is more of an adult. Not so much because there's gruesome violence or anything, but the F word is mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's some other profanity. That I know, you know, people get squeamish about that, yeah. even though, like, what teenager doesn't use that word? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And now I know you read up a storm, so oh let's goodness. let's hear it. I can't wait to hear. Well, you know, we had a rainy holiday weekend and the gentleman caller and I just hunkered down and we read, we read and read. So here we go. Get ready, everybody. <laughs> so one of the first ones that I finished was Show Your Work, 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered by Austin Kleon. I know you've read this as well. I really loved it. His premise is... Don't wait for perfection. Just start sharing, show as you go, and then you will somehow refine and get to where you want to be. Right. Part of the whole notion of networking and all of that is to just be out there and sharing your art or your creative self with the world. Right. Right. Yeah. Show your process. Right. It's such a really inspirational little book. Yeah. Little book, and I, I mean little in size but big in ideas. Yeah, I mean, he really cuts to the chase. It's separated into 10 different chapters with basic ideas. One of them was share something small every day. That seems really doable, Mm -hmm. you know? Now, my only disappointment with it is that I did read it on my Kindle. And even when I tried it on the Kindle app on my iPad, which has better image, you know, than my regular Kindle, I just felt like I was losing out on all of his images. So I'm going to buy a real copy of this. And I can see that this is one that's going to get dog-eared and underlined and write myself notes from and all of that. Yeah. I really liked it. Again, it's called Show Your Work, 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered. Then I was looking for a book that I could just get lost in. You know, I knew I'd be safe. Someone was going to tell me a good story and I'd be in good hands. So I picked up The Magnolia Palace by Fiona Davis. This is her new one. It's out January 25th. So just around the corner. You know what Fiona does? We've had her on the podcast a couple times. She's been on on episode 82 and episode 108. Her most recent was The Lions of Fifth Avenue, which takes place at the main branch of the Public Library in New York. So she takes a famous building in New York City, and then she writes a story of historical fiction. And she has a very similar style every time, two different time periods, two different points of view. The Magnolia Palace is no different. It's exactly like that. But she's using the Frick Collection as the building. I didn't know much about the Frick, except that she talked to us about it the last time we talked to her. Yeah, about what she was writing next or starting to work on. So I'm not familiar with it either. I know the name, but that's about it. Right. So Henry Clay Frick was a famous industrialist of his time. He made most of his money in Pennsylvania and then came to New York and started to buy art. And had this beautiful home that he lived in where he collected art, serious art. Mm. And upon his death, it was made into, it's not called a museum. It's called the Frick Collection. I thought it was probably called the Frick Museum. So the character that's in 1919 is Lillian Carter. 
her job when the book begins is that she's a model for sculptors and various artists in the city. Mm -hmm. And that is based on a real person in history. Her mother dies of the Spanish flu. And so Lillian becomes kind of lost and destitute. And she happens upon a job working for Helen Frick, who is Henry's very difficult daughter. And she becomes her secretary. One of the things that her father's trying to do is marry her off. And Lillian gets very involved in that. Then in current day, which in this book is 1966, there's a character, Veronica, who is an English model who gets flown into New York City to do a photo shoot at the Frick Collection. Mm. There's a blackout in the city and she gets stuck in the building And unbeknownst to her, there's another gentleman there, Joshua, who is an intern and an aspiring curator who's working there. So they get to know each other. And there's a common thread that occurs, which is what Fiona does. You know, somehow everything gets woven together beautifully. And I don't want to spoil what that is. But if you like art, especially, this book is going to be for you, just like I feel like The Lions of Fifth Avenue. If you're a book lover and love that building itself, you'll love it. So if you're familiar with the Frick, I think she does an amazing job of talking about all the art that's in the building. Yeah. And then the other thing that's cool is this character, Lillian, that's based on this model. There are really sculptures around the city that were modeled after this woman. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. So she talks about that. And there's a huge, you know me, I go to the acknowledgments first, and then there was an author note in the back as well. You know, when you read these historical fiction, it's like, what's real and what's not? Fiona really speaks to that. And I did make the mistake of reading that first. And I got partway in and I was like, Oh, this is spoilery. Stop. Okay, good to know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I always read the acknowledgments, but I probably wouldn't read that author's note until you're done. Okay. Good to know. I really enjoyed it. Really well done and exactly what I was looking for on that particular day. That's awesome. I always love a Fiona Davis novel. Yes. The Magnolia Palace by Fiona Davis. The other book I read is one I've been wanting to read for a long time. It's called The Birds of Opulence by Crystal Wilkinson. I did both audio and reading of this book, and it's very short. I want to say it's just over 200 pages. This book is the 2021 Kentucky Reads pick, you know, where everyone in the state who chooses to is reading it. And also the way that I heard about it is in 2020, it was the Agrarian Literary League selection, which is done by the Wendell Berry Center, who I worked for for a period of time. And they have a wonderful bookstore there. They chose it because there's really a theme of agriculture that runs through this book. Wilkinson has won many awards, Southern awards specifically, and it's about several generations of black women in a Southern township called Opulence, Kentucky, which is where the title comes from. And Minnie May is the matriarch of the family, and there are different chapters of the book that have different characters and different family members, and it deals a lot with mental illness and illegitimacy and your family heritage and how people in your town know about it and how people in the church know about it. And then also it's very much of the land and agriculture and farming. Beautifully written. She's a poet, so it's very spare, but says a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to read more of her books. This was her first novel, I believe. So again, that was called The Birds of Opulence by Crystal Wilkinson. And that's from University of Kentucky Press as well. I love Kentucky. It's such a beautiful state. I've driven through it and did some backpacking there and hiking and always beautiful. The whole state. So beautiful. You know, Jacob went to school there and I never was sad to make that drive. Yeah, It is all the beautiful horse country and tobacco farms and it's just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Horse Cave, Kentucky. (laughs) Have you ever seen No. I was young and my parents and I were on a road trip and I just became so fascinated with a town called Horse Cave. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in boot camp, one of the girls I was in boot camp with was from Horse Cave, Kentucky. I was like, get out. She's like, you know where that is? I was like, yes. (laughs) She must have been thrilled. (laughs) Yes. That's hilarious. 
Well, highly recommend. And if you love Kentucky, boy, it definitely does give you insight into Kentucky. So the other book I read is not out until April. I'm sorry, April 12th, 2022. Um, It's called Bomb Shelter, Love, Time, and Other Explosives. It has a fantastic cover with a turtle on it. (laughs) It's by Mary Laura Philplot. I had never heard of her. This is her second set of essays. She's being hailed as a cross between Irma Bombeck, Nora Ephron, and Lori Colwin. Damn. Yeah. She delivers. I'm here to tell you. Her first collection came out in 2019, and it was called I Miss You When I Blink. I do remember seeing the cover because it has eyelashes all over the cover. It's about being part of a family, being a worrier, which is dangerous when you have children. (laughs) And she has two teenagers. And what happens in the beginning of one of the first essays is that she and her husband are sound asleep and they hear a loud thump, like a thump that wakes you up. And they go into the bathroom and their son is on the floor having a seizure. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that throughout the course of the different essays, you find that he's diagnosed with epilepsy. So it's her kind of coming to terms with that, but also just coming to terms with her kids getting older. Many of the essays take place through the pandemic. So it's of the moment, as they say. I laughed so many times in this book, like out loud laughed. She also titles her essays in such hilarious ways. One of them is called To the Woman Screaming in the Quad. (laughs) And it's all about taking your kids on college tours and them being complete ass wipes (laughs) when you're trying to like, you've rearranged your work schedule, you've driven them, you've gotten a hotel, here's their moment to shine. And they're just being completely terrible human beings, as teenagers are wont to do sometimes. (laughs) It brought me right back to having one of those with my own son. The point of the title is that the person giving the college tour uses this mother and daughter as a cautionary tale that they were in the middle of the tour and they wandered off and then they found them screaming and yelling at each other in the middle of the quad. Yeah, that could have been me, (laughs) which is exactly what she says. I loved it so much. This part, I think you'll like, Chris, the turtle on the cover is a real turtle that visits them, it lives in their yard, and they have a metal plate at the bottom of their door, like a kick plate. And the turtle literally comes and stares at itself in the kick plate and becomes like a part of their family. And she desperately wanted to have a picture of Frank, who they named him Frank, on the cover. And one day he came out in the sunshine and she actually laid down. There's a picture of her on her website, like taking pictures of Frank. And it became... The picture on the cover. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. Super fun. Highly recommend it. I'm definitely going to check out this other essay collection as well. And this one was called Bomb Shelter, Love Time, and Other Explosives by Mary Laura Philpott. Well, this next one I'm looking forward to hearing about because it's on my shelf too. This is one we both got when we attended the Hachette Book Brunch. It's called Who is Maud Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. Holy smokes. Paige Turner loved it. If you like Patricia Highsmith, who wrote The Talented Mr. Ripley, The Price of Salt, Mm -hmm. amongst other things, she is being hailed as a Patricia Highsmith-esque writer. Twists and turns, very curvy, very surprising. The conceit of the book is it's about a young woman, Florence Darrow, who is an editorial assistant for a publishing house called Forrester Books. She gets the opportunity to work for an Elena Ferrante type author who's writing under a pen name, Maud Dixon. Nobody knows who she really is. So when Florence agrees to take the job, she has to agree to complete secrecy and also like never even saying that this job is on her resume. That was one of the deals she struck. Wow. Wow which is a setup right from the beginning. Yes. (laughs) There is a preface in the book, too, where they're in Simat, Morocco, and there's been an accident. So right away from the start, the very first page, you're like, hmm, something goes awry here. Yeah, I think for like American and British readers anyway, something set in Morocco, you know, there's going to be a mystery involved. Yes, there's many mysteries and twists and turns. I loved it. It was very clever. It was very surprising. 
really good writing and very meta also. Elena Ferrante, for people who don't know that series, it's the My Brilliant Friend and all of those people go on and on trying to figure out who this author is. And so there's that very familiar thread here because Maud Dixon is that author in this instance. And she's written a huge bestseller and is now trying to write her sophomore novel. Wow. I highly recommend it. Who is Maud Dixon by Alexandra Andrews. That was it. That was all my reading. So amazing. Good job. (laughs) Well done. Thank you. It was fun. It was fun to just have like a rainy, awful weekend and say, I'm not getting off the couch. Yeah. Perfect. Throwing books down as I finished them. (laughs) Well, we went on a Biblio adventure together. We did. It was so much fun. We hopped in the car and we drove, what is it, 90 minutes or so Mm -hmm. west towards the Connecticut, New York border to the town of Kent to visit House of Books. It was so fun. First of all, the drive was beautiful because we went both directions. We went different ways. And on the way out, we were along the Housatonic River the whole way. It was a beautiful drive. Yeah, wonderful. And now House of Books, which we both mistakenly sometimes called House of Kent, (laughs) House of Books in Kent. This is a bookstore that's been around for quite a while. And they just had a very major renovation to the entire building that they were in. So they were a couple doors down in a smaller building for, I think, like two years. So we were looking forward to seeing this amazing new space. And wow, like when we walked in, we just got goosebumps. Yeah, it was amazing. It's beautifully done with a really light colored wood. All the shelves are beautiful. They even have footstools that are the same wood. It's laid out so nicely tons of shelf talkers. Yes, they had a staff selects section with tons. I mean, it was really ceiling to floor, Mm -hmm. pretty wide. And what we liked about that is that they had pictures of the booksellers. So you know who's doing the recommendation. So if you're local, I think that would be super helpful to really get to know the booksellers and to say, hey, you recommended blah, blah, blah. So I just love that. I've never seen that before. Yeah, it made it very personal. It was really nice. And their shelf talkers were good. And it wasn't just like the most recent common books either. Yeah, it was a really nice selection. Yeah, I think with the light wood, it's very sparse. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of decoration. The star is really the books. Like it is books. And the curation was amazing. We were ooing and aahing literally in every section. Mm -hmm. Because I know like in the fiction section, they had current bestsellers, amazing backlist, classics, and then a lot of books from smaller presses, indie presses. I was so, I'm speechless. I mean, really, (laughs) I mean, it was an amazing curatorial experience. Yeah. And they had a really cool little section in the back for kids with a fort made out of books. That was beautiful. Yeah, and it's one of the great things about being short adult women is that we can fit into things like that (laughs) without having to bend over. (laughs) Yes, we have a fun picture on social media of me standing in the fort. They also had a great selection of pens and pencils. Yes. He's been looking for these special pens from Japan, and they happen to have them. Mm -hmm. So that was part of his holiday gift. Yeah, same with Laura. I bought her a selection, too, for stocking stuffer. And then they had some nice journals and series. They had different series. Mm -hmm. And they also then had British Library series. Really fantastic. We can't say enough good things about this bookstore. I bought myself a copy of MFK Fisher's Consider the Oyster. I've wanted to read her for years. I never have. I thought this would be a good place to start. They had this really cool little series of her books, and this is out from North Point Press, which is a division of Farrar, Strauss, and Gru. Nice. I bought some gifts, and then I bought four books for myself. I couldn't say no. I picked up The Best American Mystery and Suspense 2021. Alifar Burke is the guest editor. The primary editor of the series is Steph Cha. All right. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to digging into these. And then just quickly, I'll say I picked up You Should Have Left by Daniel Kelman. Never heard of this book at all. It was in their horror section. It's about a screenwriter and his wife and their four-year-old daughter who rent a house in the mountains of Germany. And things just don't seem right. 
very mm. short, yeah, thin book. And then this one attracted me. It was in their new paperback release section. It's called The Swells by Will Atkin. What attracted me was the cover. It has like these classic Japanese looking waves attempting to engulf a cruise ship. And this is set on a cruise ship. It's actually satire, which is a risk for me because I usually don't like satire, but it's uh, <laughs> it's a boatload of white privilege. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of like an upstairs, downstairs type story. Ooh, on you know, a boat. On a boat. So Count I thought, me in. Right? <laughs> and then the last one was one of the staff recommendations. It was one of their staff picks, and it was the last copy of this. And it's called Hench by Natalie Zena Walshots. So we'll see. It's a debut novel about betrayal, revenge, redemption, told with razor-sharp wit and affection. A young girl discovers the greatest superpower. So should I read this real quick? So Anna does boring things for terrible people because even criminals need office help and she needs a job. I just thought that was that hooked me. I was like, okay, I'm getting that. <laughs> that sounds so good. We had a great time. And then we went just down the street, literally, is the Kent Memorial Library, which was a beautiful little library. Yes, really. It was what, 1922, I think it was built. Emily found the cornerstone with the year and it had a couple additions put on over the years that were well done so we browsed around in there a bit which is a lot of fun one of the things that i thought was interesting is they had a lot of books for sale you know how libraries will have little racks of books for sale but they put them around in different parts of the library which was really fun so you just happen upon them and they had brand new books yeah that were for sale in there so someone must donate good stuff yes <laughs> And then right behind the library, across the train tracks, we had lunch. We did. Actually, it was really funny because we saw a long line in a different building. It was like the old train station building. And me being the food person, I was like, oh, where well, there's a line, there must be something good to eat. And we walked up to it to realize it was the COVID testing line. <laughs> yes. yes. Now a pharmacy. So we, yeah. we kept walking. We, we found pizza <laughs> yes. eventually. But yeah, it was funny. It was a lovely day. And then we hopped in the car and drove home through Litchfield. So yeah. it was beautiful. Beautiful two lane highway. And we saw Santa Claus on a motorcycle, which you can't beat that. Yeah, it was it completed the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. And then I had one couch biblio adventure I wanted to talk about. It was through the 92nd Street Y. The video is available. So I'll put a link in the show notes. And it was a conversation between Huma Abedin, Hillary Clinton and Samantha Berry about Huma's new memoir called Both And. Mm -hmm. To remind people, she worked for Hillary Clinton for over 25 years. She came into the White House as an intern, ended up being her chief of staff. Amongst other, she was also the deputy chief of staff when Hillary was secretary of state. She was a political staffer during the 2016 campaign, a traveling chief of staff and assistant during the 2008 campaign. She started working as an intern in school in the White House. These two have never appeared on stage together. Wow. And this is their only plan to appear on stage together. Samantha Berry is the editor of Glamour. It was such a fun conversation. I have watched it twice. Wow. Yeah. I highly recommend it. They told so many fun stories, many of which are in the book, some of which are not. Huma is also known for being the wife of Anthony Weiner, who got himself into a lot of trouble. He's a sex addict, did some very inappropriate things. He had a very promising career and ran for mayor of New York. One of the things that they talk about is that when a lot of things went wrong with Huma and her now ex-husband, it really affected Hillary, particularly her bid for the 2016 presidential campaign. And a lot of people thought that Hillary should fire Huma. And, you know, Hillary's opinion was, why would I do that? She hasn't done anything wrong. Right. Huma talked about how Hillary always approached her, especially in her times of need, as her friend first, not her boss, That's which I thought cool. was so lovely. But I'll just tell you an example of like one of the stories they told that was so funny. And this one is in the book. So Hillary, it's now 2009. She had a failed bid for presidency, but she's now the Secretary of State under the Obama administration. They are in Germany for the G20 summit. 
She's about to have dinner with Andrea Merkel and, you know, the president of the United States. She doesn't want to be late, but they're really tired. They've been working really hard. They're staying at a place with a nice spa. So Huma says, why don't you go take a massage? And Hillary's like, I'm not going to take a massage. She's like, just go. You have an hour and a half. Finally, she convinces her. She goes down, goes to get the massage. Suddenly, someone knocks on the door with Huma and says, um, you have 30 minutes. You need to be at this dinner in 30 minutes. And she said, 30 minutes? It says an hour and 30 minutes on the schedule. And they're like, mm, typo, you know. Oh, so she goes downstairs, you know, knock, knock, knock on the door and says to Hillary, you have to get up. You have to get up now. And she said Hillary was so tired at this point that she was like, wow, that hour went by so quickly. <laughs> and she comes out. And as you are after a massage, like her mascara was down her cheek. Her hair is sticking up on end. And she's like, at this point, we have like 10 minutes to get her to this dinner, which they did. But there's just tons of very humorous human stories that they share. They obviously have incredible affinity for each other. And I really want to listen to this book. One of the other things Huma says is, you know, if she had written this book two years ago, it would have been a much more bitter, angry book. But with some time and distance from her situation with her ex-husband, she's written a book that is more about her life and her career, her, some of her experiences. So I really appreciated that. Again, the memoir is called Both And, and this is a conversation between Hillary Clinton, Huma Abedin, and Samantha Berry, 92nd Street Y. I will put a link in the show notes. Oh, cool. I'm definitely going to watch that. Yeah, it's super fun. All right, everybody. Well, coming up next, it's our top 10 of 2021. Emily, myself, and Russell of Ink and Paper Blog are going to share our titles. So potentially 30 books coming your way. Emily will list them all in the show notes. So don't feel like you have to write things down if you're driving or walking. They'll all be there on the website. And we're also going to make a page on our bookshop.org page with all of them. And a reminder, send in by email bookcougars at gmail.com your list of top 10s. People are already cheating. I've gotten a top 11 and a top 12. We feel you. <laughs> yeah, we do. We understand. <laughs> Well, as promised, everyone, here we are back again to talk about our top 10 favorite reads of 2021. We are joined by the amazing Russell of Ink and Paper Blog, BookTube channel. Welcome back, Russell. Thank you all for having me. I'm so excited. Well, we're so excited. This is becoming our annual tradition to do with you. It is. And the pressure was on this year, so... <laughs> Russell has talked about how he's had such a great reading year. And the problem with having a great reading year is then choosing your top 10, as we like to say, for today, because yes. it could change, as Russell confessed by the hour, because he said he was changing his top 10 as he dialed into Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have made this list over and over and over again. Uh, there were 18 books competing for the top 10. So hopefully this one stands <laughs> for at least the next... <laughs> couple of hours as we record. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just was going to say that I was listening to Fresh Air the other day and she had Justin Chang, who does her movie reviews, on to talk about his top choices of the year. And he said it was so hard. Here are my top 11. And I just started laughing out loud because I was like, oh, <laughs> it's hard for everybody. <laughs> I, I, there were, there's 11 books here because I am so sad that that 11th book can't be somehow in the 10. So I feel him. I feel him. I'm sure it'll be mentioned. Yes. <laughs> All right. Russell, why don't you start us off? Okay. Well, if you guys listened uh, for last year, I actually put mine in a top 10 order. So we're going to go from 10 to 1 for me. The first book in my 10th place is uh, Steel Life by Sarah. Winman. I have read every book that Sarah Winman has written. I'm a huge fan and people may know her for Tin Man that came out a couple of years ago and was everywhere. So this book starts at the end of World War II. We have a young British officer who is in Florence, Italy, and his battalion is there to save art. And he meets a older lesbian woman and she is there to also try to save the art it's sort of just kismet that they meet 
and they totally remember each other for the rest of their lives. On his last day in Florence, the officer saves the life of a man, a man who's going to commit suicide, and he convinces him not to. And when he passes away, he leaves him his home in Florence. So this man and his ragtag group of friends and, you know, self-made family move to Florence and start a life. And it just follows them um, from like, like the 1940s through the 1980s in Florence. And we also get Evelyn, who I will never forget. She's the older lesbian woman. And she's like in her 80s by the time the book ends or 90s, maybe even. And she's fantastic and it's just one of those books where you just follow a group of people that you fall in love with all through but it talks about art it talks about war it talks about love it talks about relationships but it's just about these people and you can just feel so immersed in them and you will cry and you will laugh and there's a parrot that is hilarious (laughs) so that's I have a hard time summarizing it because it's so wide in scope but just dive in get lost in Florence Italy and trust Sarah Winman to take you on a ride. And I promise you, you will enjoy it. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> TBR is growing already. <laughs> yeah. And we just want to remind everyone that we do put these all in the show notes. So there will be a list. Yes. Well, by the end, there will be 30 books. That's too much to remember. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Listening, so. yes. Well, I didn't put my books in any order. What I did was I just sat down and I started thinking about the books that I read. And I started a list that way before I looked at Goodreads. So up first is Country Place by Anne Petrie. This is a novel that came out in 1947, and she's the author of The Street, which I know a lot of people have raved about. That was the first novel that sold a million copies by an African-American writer. So big stuff. After that huge success, she moved back to Old Saybrook, Connecticut, where she was from. And A Country Place, it's a really powerful novel. I mean, I think it's just as powerful as The Street, but in different ways. It's the story of a young man who's coming home after serving in World War II. He's been gone for four years, and a lot has changed. The book starts with him coming off of the train into town, and someone picks him up at the train station, and as he's driving through town to his parents' home, he notices things, and it's a little bit foreboding of what's to come. He's married to a woman. They married young. And so most of the book is about him trying to save their marriage as he interacts with all of these people in town who kind of know what's been going on with the wife. I guess that's all I'm going to say. Right on. But, you know, Ann Petrie, I want to read all her stuff. I have another one queued up for next year. I, too, did not put mine in an order. Mm -hmm. I mean, choosing 10 is hard enough. I'm very (laughs) impressed, Russell. And I'm starting off with nonfiction. And one of my favorites this year was Keep Moving Notes on Loss, Creativity, and Change by the poet Maggie Smith. This is a book of essays and daily manifestations. She started after her divorce just every day. She had a prompt of keep moving, and then she would start writing and see what came to mind for her. And one of the things that I loved about it is the idea that you can start with a simple idea and turn it into something that speaks to you personally and turns into a book. You know, she didn't sit down to write this book. It kind of wrote itself in a certain way. But the essays that thread throughout really are helpful if you're going through a time of change or a time of grief. A journal is out now. There's a keep moving journal that I got gifted as a holiday gift. So I can't wait to start it. It's going to be one of my projects for 2022. All right, Russell, your number nine. My number nine is the novel Brood by Jackie Polzin. I don't even really know how to describe this book, but this is the story of a woman who has suffered a loss and in suffering that loss decides to raise chickens in her backyard. And all I'll say is by the end, I have been obsessed with the idea of raising chickens (laughs) and want to raise chickens so bad. If you take a moment to look at the cover of this book, it is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. But it's really just, and I think this is a theme of my reading this year. I was really moved by books where you were in the mind of a person dealing with something about life and how do you move on. In the book, her husband is applying for another job that means that they will have to move. And she 
is constantly thinking about having to possibly leave her chickens and what that means to her because the chickens have fulfilled a void due to this tragedy she's gone through. It's just about relationships. It's about motherhood. It's about being a woman and wanting children and maybe not being able to have them and sort of the juxtaposition of how you feel in society that puts that pressure on you. But it's also just about growth and healing and all of that. And it is a beautiful little book that I have thought about ever since I read it. I loved that book, too. That almost hit my top 10. I'm so <laughs> glad you mentioned it. That's It's a great book and very unusual. Yes, absolutely. And I thought that the part that hurt came a little out of nowhere for me. And I often am never surprised. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. So. Nice. All right. Well, next up for me is a mystery, Clark and Division by Naomi Hirahara. This just came out in 2021 from Soho Press. It's one that Julia Graham sent us thinking we'd like it. And I definitely liked it. Here I am talking about it as one of my top tens. This is a mystery about mainly a 20 year old Japanese woman whose family had been interred in a concentration camp, the Manzanar camp in California. Her dad was a successful manager of a produce store. They were very solid middle class family. And then they got relocated. A lot of families were released before the war ended if they were considered non-threatening. So her family was released to move to Chicago. The older sister had moved first and was really enjoying it and was setting things up for the family to come. They arrive. They don't hear from the daughter, the older sister. They find out that she committed suicide. But the sister doesn't think her sister would have committed suicide, so hence the mystery starts. And what I liked about this one so much is that it's one of those entertaining novels that teaches you about history as you go along without being condescending or not forcing it at all. So, and I thought the plot was very original and solidly plotted, great characters. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. I think Aunt Ellen read it Mm -hmm. and she liked it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be on her top 10 list though. It was not, I can confirm, because I just got that right before we (laughs) recorded. Yeah, yeah. So I really liked it. And Naomi Hirahara has written other novels and there is one in the works that picks up with this family after they move from Chicago back to California after the war's end. Well, my second book is called Inheritance of Orchieta Divina by Zoraida Cordova. Cordova is well known for her teen series and fantasy series called The Brooklyn Brujas. And she's also the co-editor of the anthology Vampires Never Get Old. (laughs) This is her first novel for adults, though, and I was thrilled. I happened upon it at a little free library. I didn't know anything about this book, and I loved it. It's about the Montoya family. They are all beckoned by the matriarch of the family to come to her funeral where they are each given an inheritance that affects their future. And the rest of the novel is filled with magical realism. They travel to Ecuador. It's very rich and familial, and I loved every minute of it. And I love Alice Hoffman, and I feel like here Cordova is coming along, this young author who can carry on the tradition of wonderful adult novels filled with magical realism. I have that book on my shelf, and I... It's one of the many I'm someday (laughs) will get to. (laughs) I think the cover of that book is also beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Well, my next book is Three O'Clock in the Morning by Gianrico Carofiglio. And that is translated from the Italian by Howard Curtis. I don't know much about Gianrico Carofiglio, but from what I've been told, I believe he is mainly a thriller writer in Italy. And this is outside of his normal scope. But this is the story of a father and son. We meet a young family with one son who, um, when he's about eight years old, I believe, gets diagnosed with epilepsy. He winds up going to a specialist in Marseille. And they put him on all this medication, tell him to come back when he's 18 years old, and they'll see if the medication has cured his epilepsy and if he needs the medication any longer. Well, in that time, his parents have gotten divorced. His father has moved out. His relationship with his father is very strained. But his father is the only one that can take him to Marseille 
when he gets there, they say, okay, what we're going to do is you have to stay up for 48 hours. And if you don't have a seizure in that time, we'll consider you cured, basically, and you don't have to be on the medication anymore. And it is 48 hours of this father and son getting to know each other again on the backdrop of hoping he's been cured from this disease that could affect him for the rest of his life. They learn a lot about each other. I think the son learns maybe he's not given his father a fair shake with the divorce and everything that's happened. And the father hasn't gotten to know his son. And they do all these crazy things all night long for two days across Versailles. And then um, at the end, you know, and then they sort of learn about each other and their relationship's more solid. I won't say anything about the ending other than it absolutely broke my heart and I cried for probably a good hour after I finished mm. this book. Yeah, so that's Three O'Clock in the Morning by Gianricchio Carofiglio and translated from the Italian by Howard Curtis. Sounds really good. Mm, yeah. Well, I'm going back in time. My next book is Bleak House by Charles Dickens, which came out in 1853. <laughs> back in time. <laughs> 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 Yes. Oh, my gosh. I read this one in the summer. It was for Sue's big book, Summer Reading Challenge. And I had picked up a copy of Bleak House, I think around this time last year, because I knew I wanted to read Charles Dickens. And a lot of people have said that this is one of his better ones. I read it in paper, but then I also listened to an audio version narrated by Simon Vance. He did an amazing job with all of the characters and the different accents and men's voices and women's voices. I really loved it. I guess I'm not going to go into too much detail about the actual book itself. It's Charles Dickens. So there are orphans who are living on the street. There are people who are orphans and don't know what their lineage is. There are rich people who are not happy people. There's the evil scheming lawyer, you know. Charles Dickens. You mean it's Dickensian? It's Dickensian. <laughs> That's only half of the 244 characters you will find in Bleak House. <laughs> I so loved it, and it, it did make me want to read more Dickens. So You go. I will be reading another one in 2022. Not sure which one, but uh, thank you, Charles Dickens. Oh, and I did watch the BBC adaptation, too, starring Gillian Anderson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was pretty entertaining as well. Jillian Anderson can do no wrong. Yeah, I know. I'll watch She's her in phenomenal. anything. She yeah. just She's and she so just good. gets better with age. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My next book is another nonfiction. It's called Finding Freedom: A Cook's Story, Remaking a Life from Scratch. This is by Erin French. She owns the restaurant the Lost Kitchen up in Freedom, Maine. And it's a memoir about another restaurant that she owned with her husband. It was very stressful. Their relationship wasn't good. She ended up becoming very addicted to pills and alcohol and lost her whole life, including her son, her restaurant, her marriage. And the memoir is really about her picking herself back up and having to get her life back together, starting another restaurant with the help of her mother and her father. It talks about how her father taught her how to cook and her love of food and how food kind of helps build her back out of her dark days. And I would desperately love to go to this restaurant and eat. You only can make reservations by postcard. Mm -hmm. Once a year, they accept postcards. I sent a postcard this year and didn't get in. Millions of people probably send postcards. But anyway, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed her perseverance as a human being and as a mother and as a chef. So if you like food memoirs, this is a good one. I told my husband right before we started this, I said, I wonder how many food memoirs are going to be on Emily's <laughs> list this year. I said, I said, I get to hear about all of them and I don't because they're not in my normal space. And I'm like, this is what I wait for. I wait to hear from, them, from Emily at this time of year. So um, I love anything about food and food sounds. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so yeah. I need to read more memoirs. That's on my 2022 uh, checklist this year, so. I love them. I could almost read solely read memoir, but I know that I would miss fiction, but I love it so much. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go to Japan now, and I'm going to talk about Heaven by Miko Kawakami, translated from the Japanese by 
um, Sam Bett and David Boyd. Now, you may have heard of her book, Breasts and Eggs, mm-hmm. which was everywhere for a while. So this is the follow up to it. This is the story of a young boy in junior high school that is bullied beyond belief because he has a lazy eye. He is treated horribly, both physically and emotionally by his peers. And one day, this young woman in the classroom reaches out to him. She is also bullied because of the way she looks and money issues. And they create a friendship. The book deals with how people work through the trauma of being bullied and how they create relationships, but also how when you've been treated this way for a long time, it's very difficult to trust even the people that look and feel like they want to be your friends. And it is so, I have never read a book that has made me feel so visceral about the experience of bullying in the school system. This really touched, because I was horribly bullied in junior high and high school. So like there was a lot of this that just felt so real and heartbreaking. And it is beautiful and it is poetic. It has all of the stuff you need from an amazing book about a horrible topic. Mm -hmm. But it'll break your heart. Yeah. So, gosh, I'm breaking hearts this you year. You are. Gosh, did, did you read Breast and Eggs? I did. I liked this one better. Okay, I say, because I got halfway through it, and I, did, I stopped, and I don't remember why. I think it was kind of dark. Yeah, I think she is um, a rather dark author. Mm-hmm. She is very well known in Japan, mm-hmm. so I think, yeah, I'm pretty impressed with her. But that book, woof, yeah. that's all I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to go to a dark place, but in a fun way with the next book. This is kind of a cheat because it's a twofer, but it's A Solitude of Wolverines by Alice Henderson. So I also have to mention her follow-up, the second in the Alex Carter series, A Blizzard of Polar Bears, which came out this year. I almost said today. (laughs) (laughs) This year. It's a great series. And Emily and I have both read both of these books. And for listeners who might just be tuning in for the first time, Alex Carter is a field biologist who at the opening of the first book is in Boston at a celebration for a park that's going to be opening. And there's an event that happens that's scary. And she decides when she gets an offer for her next gig to leave to go to the mountains and track wolverines on this land reserve just to kind of see what the population is. And of course, there is a mystery, but it's so cool because she's a kick-ass character, strong, independent woman, knows her stuff, completely competent, wondering what's going to happen with her relationship. Her boyfriend, who she left back in Boston, is a lawyer. They've been kind of on a bit of a break when mystery ensues. (laughs) And she's, she's staying in the mountains, out west, in an abandoned ski lodge. You know, so you can't help but think of Stephen King. Right. You know, you just. Sounds like my worst nightmare. (laughs) (laughs) But it's great. Like if you like the great outdoors and animals, you will love this series. Yeah. And a fierce protagonist. Yes. Yeah. And there's some mystery about somebody who's sending her these postcards from different locations. You're not really sure what's going on with that. You find out a little bit of her backstory with her mom who is no longer with her. And then her father, who is super supportive. He's back in Berkeley, where she's from originally. They have a great relationship. The animals are really neat to read about. You learn about animals along the way. And then it's just the great outdoors. You kind of feel like you're there in this brisk mountain air hiking with her. Yeah, it's really good. My next book is a novel. It's a debut, and it's called The Push by Ashley Audrain. This book is so hard to talk about. Um, It's one of those butt clenchers, and it kept me on the edge of my seat every page. And it's about motherhood, expectations you have as a mother. This woman is a young mother. She has a child who things just don't feel right. Like she's out on the playground and other kids get hurt when her kid's around, things like that. And she starts to feel like something's not right with her daughter, but nobody believes her. No one will listen to her. So it's a lot about that women know things 
People don't listen to what they have to say. Her husband doesn't believe her. And her husband has a different experience with this child than she does. And then they have a second baby. And I'm not going to say anything more than that because it would give it away. But the gist of it is that feeling of early motherhood, you've sold this bill of goods, like having a baby is going to be this wonderful, amazing experience. And sometimes things aren't as they are sold. (laughs) That sounds creepy. I remember you talking about that book. Yeah. And it's one of those books, you close the book and you think, how did she write this book? I mean, to be inside of that character for as long as she must have had to been to write this book. It's just like, Ooh, I I need to, well, maybe I don't want to meet the author, but part of me (laughs) wants to. (laughs) Wow. This is going to be quite an eclectic list for your listeners. (laughs) We are all over the place. We sure are. (laughs) (laughs) The next book that I'm going to talk about is The Promise by Damon Galga. This won the Booker Prize this year and Damon had been nominated, shortlisted twice before. So this was his third novel to be shortlisted in his first win. He is a South African writer, and he is a gay man. The premise is it takes place over four funerals in a family. The first funeral is the funeral of the mother. She's been sick for a long time, and she's passing away. And the youngest daughter hears her make her father promise that he will give the house that their black maid lives in to the black maid when she dies. Now, the book takes place before and after apartheid in South Africa. And before apartheid, black men and women could not own any property. But the husband makes this promise, and this young girl hears it. The mom passes, the father doesn't keep the promise, and that promise affects this family for the rest of their lives together. Mm -hmm. And this young woman never forgets it. And she is never able to get over the fact that her family does not give this home immediately to this woman who's raised her and her siblings and has been a fixture in their home forever. And you learn about the different culture after and before apartheid is how that whole experience was affecting this family and how they weren't changing. And it's just fascinating, but it's heart-wrenching and it is it, it's like this weird sort of tension as you want people to evolve and they're not. Mm. And you have the one character that's just watching them not evolve and getting angrier and angrier about mm. it. It's brilliant. So that's The Promise by Damon Galgut. I highly recommend that. It. It's really, really good. That sounds so good. It does, yes. <laughs> well, my next book is Oh, Beautiful by Jong Yoon. I didn't, I cheated. <laughs> I was like, I know Chris is going to put this on her list, so I'm taking another slot for something else. Oh my God, that is so funny. Don't think I didn't do the same thing. <laughs> well, you know, listeners know that Emily and I were awaiting the release of this book, of Jung's second novel, because we love Shelter so much. And Old Beautiful definitely delivered as well. It's a really engaging, I think fast-paced, pretty dark novel about this woman's experience as she's transitioned from working as a model to becoming a journalist. And she gets this great gig to leave New York, to go back to North Dakota to write about her town, which has experienced this huge oil boom And it's completely changed the culture. And she's half Korean, half white. So she's always been an outsider wherever she is. One of those people who has a foot in and a foot out, doesn't feel like she fits in. And people always make sure to let her know that she doesn't fit in. Mm -hmm. She meets her sister. They haven't been on good terms for a long time, but they do meet. So there are some interactions with them. We talked with Jung about this on episode 142. So, you know, we talked with her about like, what kind of research did you do? She actually went to one of the Boomtown areas on her own and did a lot of research and experienced what it's like to be a woman of Korean descent being in this predominantly male atmosphere that's very white. Yeah. 
there's stuff about women's relationships in here, how women of different classes and races get along and interact. Her old professor, who she had a relationship with, is one of the reasons why she got this gig. And you find out why as the book unfolds. Right. So there's a little bit of a Me Too thread yes, in the book as well. It's exactly. very of the moment. It really is. And there's a Native American thread because there's a reservation nearby where a lot of abuse against women is discussed. Right. And I don't want to say too much because I don't want to give any spoilers because Emily and I both gasped a couple times while reading this novel. Can't recommend it enough. You I kind mean. of gasp from the opening scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the same with Shelter. Like the Shelter had such an impactful opening scene and a lot of jaw dropping moments. And I felt like, oh, Beautiful is such a different novel, but her writing chops just getting going, I think. You yeah. know, people always worry about the sophomore slump. Yeah, not you in know, this case. Not in this case at all. Yeah. Oh, Beautiful. My next book is Trouble Can Be So Beautiful at the Beginning by Shuli Kaywood. Shuli is a friend of ours. She's a writer, a teacher, and a poet. And what I loved about this collection is it was so accessible. I mean, there wasn't a poem in the collection that I didn't understand. It's really about love, hardship, learning about ourselves through relationships Shuli was raised in Ohio, so there are very Ohio-specific poems, and then she spent time in Mexico. Her mother is from Mexico City, so there are also poems that have to do with Mexico as well. There are poems that have food in them, poems that have love, loss. It's a great collection. I can't recommend it highly enough. It also has a beautiful cover with a photograph taken by someone I grew up with, so that was fun too. Trouble Can Be So Beautiful at the Beginning, Shuli Kaywood. Shuli's short story collection was on your list last year, right? It was, yeah. A small thing to want? Yeah. She's put out a book every year of the podcast. Yeah. We, we like to think that we've motivated her. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> what did I read by her? Her what memoir? What was the first thing she put out? The Going in Goodbye? Memoir? Maybe, Yeah. You know what it's like when you read as much as us. Sometimes you know you've read something, but you can't remember. Mm -hmm. Like, you mean I can't remember what I finished yesterday? Yeah, I know exactly (laughs) what you're talking about. (laughs) Yes, yes. yes. That's why I'm so impressed when Chris says, oh, I just sit down and write. I'm like, I can't remember what I read this month. I love what I read at the start of the year. Like, to just create a list would never work for me. Well, I have to say, like, that, that list, when I sat down, it was eight books. That's impressive. Because I thought about eight books that have stuck in my mind, you know. And then when I opened up Goodreads, oh, my God, you know, I felt like it was a really good reading year. And there's so many great novels. And some of them I gave five stars to that didn't necessarily end up in my list here. Because, well, Emily and I were talking earlier about that, you know, when you finish a book and you're on a high about it. But does it stick with you long term? And then the same thing goes with a book. Maybe you don't give it a star rating or you think, well, that was good. But that something about it lodges into your brain and you find yourself thinking about it throughout the Mm -hmm. year. Or as I said to Chris, one of the ones on my list I read on vacation. And I think that has to do something with it as well. Like it's just like time and place, you Mm -hmm. know, happy book. Yes. (laughs) I often find that my top 10 has a lot of four star reads on it because of that exact same reason. Maybe, you know, there's something about it that didn't quite work, but I think about it Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that sometimes supersedes the fact that I gave another book five stars but I haven't thought about it as much since. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. But of course, tomorrow it could be all of your five stars could be tomorrow, right? What is, oh, yeah. <laughs> On your tomorrow yeah. list. I'm just kidding. I know. Yeah. We I'm so sad. I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're not going to talk about this book. It's <laughs> 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 so heartbreaking. This did we really say that? Did we say that though to listeners that this is our top ten list today? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> We've made that abundantly clear. <laughs> oh goodness. Okay. Well, the next book I'm going to tell you about is *The Arsonist's City* by Hala Alan. I think I've talked about this book all year long since I've read it because. I really thought everyone was going to read this book, and I just don't feel like enough people have. Another sort of theme for my year has been books about families. And this is the story of the Nassar family, and they currently live like in 
Texas and California, I think, but uh, mother is Syrian and the father is Lebanese and they moved to America and had three children. It starts with the fact that the grandfather has passed away and his house in Beirut falls to the father and the father wants to sell it. And the mother is not having it. And she decides to rope all of her children in, sort of guilt trips them into all coming together in Beirut to convince the father not to sell this house. Each of the children is unique. There's queer representation. There's representations of just like difficult marriage relationships. There's these flashbacks to the difficulties in that region and how they affected this relationship between the mother and father and the loss that they suffered and how difficult it was just to sort of be in a relationship and travel in that region when they were younger. And it is just beautiful and it's just familial and it is touching and heartbreaking and like episodic and a saga and all of those good words that you love (laughs) um at its heart it's about family and loving one another and getting over all that stuff that sometimes gets in the way I think Chris was talking earlier there's a lot of history in the book so you learn a lot about the area and the region and the people too which I thought was just beautifully done I absolutely loved it I cannot recommend it highly enough I thought it was beautiful so that's The Arsonist City by Hala Alam All right next up for me is a nonfiction The Only Wonderful Things The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis by Melissa Homestead This came out this year 2021 from Oxford University Press And it was a long-awaited book. Melissa Homestead is one of the premier Cather scholars in the world. The book that she wrote here, The Only Wonderful Things, is an exploration really of how deeply Edith Lewis impacted Cather's writing. She worked for an advertisement company, and she had a very empowering, powerful career of her own. Homestead really looks at how she edited Cather directly on the page, because there are manuscripts in the archives with Edith Lewis's handwriting all over them and Cather's handwriting. So you can really see how she helped shape her fiction, which is tremendous, as it really restores Edith Lewis as Cather's partner. Um, Because when Cather died in 1947, there was Cold War hysteria over homophobia, over homosexuality, I should say. This biographer was really desperate to try and find a man in Cather's life. And there was also an old friend of Cather's, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, who also shaped the biographer's understanding of Cather, that there was a man somewhere. There had to be a man somewhere. Like these are what their letters were about, which is really awful. So Lewis was completely disregarded as Cather's partner. She was dismissed as like a secretary. One of the good things that this book does is it really restores Edith Lewis as Cather's partner. Cather and Lewis weren't hiding. They weren't in the closet, which is a 1960s conception anyway. They just weren't radical. They weren't activists. So they're not looked at as like model lesbians. They're more of the old school Boston marriage type. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good model for how you could look at lesbian relationships in a time when they weren't something that people broadcasted. Okay, that was The Only Wonderful Things, The Creative Partnership of Willa Cather and Edith Lewis by Melissa Homestead. The next book I'm going to talk about was one that I read with Russell in our book club, and it's called The Hair by Melanie Finn. I don't think Russell loved this book as much as I did. I don't think it's on his top 10. Not on my top 10. (laughs) (laughs) This book was very atmospheric and dark and unusual. And I have thought about it a lot. I couldn't put it down when I read it. I read it in one day. And I kept texting our other buddy, Ryan, who's in our book club, (laughs) like, oh, my God, this book, because he'd already read it. It's about Rosie, who's college age. At the beginning of the novel, she's in MoMA in New York City. She's there for college, and she runs into a man that's older than her named Bennett, who seems very wealthy and living in the world. She falls for him. She gets pregnant. They end up for a little while living on the Gold Coast of Connecticut, which is kind of the southern coastline from where we live. For a little while, they're living a very swanky lifestyle, but then things go awry and she ends up living in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, 
which is very much a place where homesteader types live. And she, for reasons I won't go into, because that would be giving away too many spoilers, starts to raise her child by herself with a few other characters that help. There's a really large time span. It spans from the 80s through the 2000s and packs a punch in a very few pages. I think it's 300 pages, but it's also like a little small square book. It was shocking on many levels, and I really liked it. It's not in my top 10, but it is a book that I could talk about for hours. <laughs> yeah. I think it's one of those books that you can literally sit there and pick it apart and then talk about the same scene 10 minutes later and look mm-hmm. at something completely different all over again. So I appreciate her talent, and I appreciate the depth at which she tackles some very tough topics. Yes. And also the ending was one of those that we talked about so much in book club because everybody had kind of different feelings about the ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It had a very unusual ending. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to go from that to the hey. How's that sound? (laughs) (laughs) Um, The next book on my list is Intimacies by Katie Kitamura. This is about a woman, a young woman who takes a job as a translator at The Hague. She really has no sense of home. She's very displaced and she's looking for sort of a place. She gets involved with a man who is sort of separated from his wife and starts a relationship, but... You know how that's going to end, right? Mm-hmm. And um, But what's really happening is she gets involved in a political trial that's going on at The Hague. And it's about like sort of the political circus of it all. But as an insider, as a person who has to remain detached because she's actually the translator for the man on trial. Mm-hmm. And she's hearing all this stuff that he supposedly did. And she's trying to sort of justify her feelings of, I kind of like him when I talk to him, but then I hear Mm -hmm. and then I translate the words and I, the disconnect is very difficult. She's very disconnected because she doesn't have a sense of home. It is utterly brilliant. The book is very short, but it just tackles so many things. It's another book just from a one person's perspective, but you see so much of the world through her eyes that it's just amazing. It's just very timely too. Yeah, it's brilliant. So that's Intimacies by Katie Kitamura. I think that's one. It's either been on a lot of lists or it's one something. I can't remember. I've seen it everywhere. It was long listed for the National Book Award and tragically did not make the short list. Yeah, I really want to read that. So I don't know. I don't think that I've told your listeners this last year, but this year, all the books I read, I listen to the audio. So I can tell you every single book that I'm talking about today has a fantastic audio book as well, because I listen while I read. <laughs> and that's a fantastic audio. All right. Next up for me, looks like there's another nonfiction, and it is The Doctor's Blackwell, How Two Pioneering Sisters Brought Medicine to Women and Women to Medicine. And this is by Janice Nimura. It was one of our read-along books, and we also got to talk with Janice on episode 139, So this is a story about Elizabeth Blackwell, who was the first woman MD in the United States, 1849. She got into medical school kind of um, almost like as a joke. The men admitted her. Women weren't allowed at this time in most higher educational institutions and certainly not in medicine. They let her in and she was a fabulous student. And her sister followed in her footsteps, Emily, her younger sister, who was the more brilliant physician. But I really like that it was a joint biography that really kind of showed what women went through to accomplish their dreams. And then how the two different sisters had very different temperaments and how those manifested and how they pursued science because they had very different trajectories. Yeah. One of them didn't even like touching patients. Elizabeth. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth, the older one, she was more about like hygiene and she was really involved in sanitation, which yeah. was a huge issue, you know, in the 19th century for cities when you didn't have indoor plumbing. What do you do with all that poop and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> disease and right. things like that. So yeah, that was a good book. Yeah. We had a really good discussion with our read along folks on Zoom too. Yeah. What do you do with all that poop? I feel like that... <laughs> That belongs on a t-shirt, maybe? I don't know. I don't think you walk away from that catchphrase. Everybody has to deal with poop. 
Well, just imagine that. I just, I mean, I, I don't the want things, to. When it comes to like <laughs> time travel, I think it'd be fascinating to be dropped down into a 19th century city or even like a swank party from the 19th century with famous people. It had to smell awful. Yeah. And they itched too because mm-hmm. they had bugs. They, they didn't bathe as much. I mean, not that people were like dirty, dirty. No, but, but yeah, it was just yeah. different, you know, that you didn't have the kind of deodorants and soaps and yeah. indoor plumbing that we are. I love today. indoor yeah. plumbing. I love it. <laughs> I do. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> One time I took Jacob to camp and we're walking up a hill to his cabin and he turns to me and he looks at me and goes, mom, do they have bathrooms here? And I said, that's exactly the question I'd be asking right about now. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, they do. My next book is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer, another one of our (laughs) read-alongs. This was our year of nonfiction read-alongs. I loved this book. I mostly listened to the audio. It was narrated by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Her voice, so lovely. Her essays were lovely too, but to have her reading them to you was just a treat. She's a female scientist and an indigenous woman. Her essays were about motherhood. They were about being a teacher. They were about becoming a scientist and some of the assholery that she faced in academia about being a female interested in science. And she helped me garner a better understanding of how the living world is connected and the impact of some of our choices on the environment right now. Highly recommend. And I highly recommend the audio, although I have both and I did read it as well. Same here. And this is one that I didn't put on my list because I knew Emily was going to have it on hers. So I second everything she just said. We did everything we could not to have an 11 books on our list. <laughs> See, that it seems unfair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get the, the cheat note. So next year I'll have to make Ryan come and then him and I can do it. <laughs> well, you can give your 11th book if you have to, Russell. We'll forget <laughs> I was going to say, so all of the books that I have talked about, I've talked about seven of them. They are all in an order, but the top three are my top three books of the year. These will definitely not move. In third is The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon. I can never say her middle name, and it makes me so angry at myself because I love her so much. Jeffers, now it seems weird to talk about a book that is like an Oprah book and everything that doesn't normally fit into what I would read. But this book is fantastic. It's sort of like two different books put together. One is like an oral history of this one family from the point of when the first father met the first mother and started the family. And it was a black man met an Indian woman on Indian land, started a family, and then it follows them through history. So through slavery, the taking away of their land, through the Civil War, into modern times. So you get to learn about the entire family while you are also in the story of Ailey, who is the current generation of the family. She is a young woman who is dealing with just the world and family and what's going on for Black women in America right now. And all of that, it's so hard to explain because it's so epic, but it works so well together. And it is beautiful. So Honoré was shortlisted for the poetry national book award the year before this book came out and you can totally tell she's a poet and you just get lost in this family and it breaks your heart you know they deal with racism they deal with drugs they deal with the criminal system they deal with their land being taken away but you also have this young woman who's going to do something for herself and what happens she winds up in the history department of a university following the footsteps of her grandfather and starts looking back on her family and putting all of those pieces together. Mm. So then you're asking yourself at the end, who's telling us the oral history? Mm. So it's 800 pages. You know, I would never recommend an 800 page (laughs) book. It's so outside my comfort zone, but you will fly through it. And it is beautiful. And it's my pick to win the Pulitzer next year. The love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, Honoré, Fanonone, Jeffers, and I just adore her. And this book is fantastic. 
You heard it here first, people. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's queued up for me next, Russell. It's what I'm going to spend the weekend reading. I can't it's wait. It's a phenomenal audio book. I have both, so I cannot yeah. wait. Right it's on. It's so good. Does she read it? Do you know? No, she does okay. not. Um, I think it has a number of narrators, if I remember, mm. because there's different voices in the book. Oh, but, nice. I like that. Yeah. That's yeah, a real, it seems like a real performance then, you know? Yes. Like, yeah. Yes. And it's one of those books when I would just sit down and read it and totally forget I was anywhere but in the lives of these people. Mm. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's brilliant. That's really so. great. Because so often these days you hear, oh, it's 800 pages and it should have been 600 yeah. or 400 and... Yeah. I haven't heard anyone say that this book should be any shorter than it is. Yeah. And if a poet's going to write a book that long, I mean, poets are pretty good at being spare with words. Mm-hmm. So Yeah. I loved it. I can't wait. It's tempting me. <laughs> 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 All right. So next up for me is a novel called Leaving Coy's Hill by Catherine Sherbrooke. And this one came out in 2021 too from Pegasus Books. And it's a historical fiction novel and a biography about Lucy Stone, who was an abolitionist and suffragette. At a young age, she was appalled to learn that women, once they married, had zero rights to themselves, to property, to their children. So she vowed not to marry because she didn't want to find herself in a situation that one of her friends had found herself in. But then along comes Henry Blackwell brother of Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell, who I just talked about in the uh, previous book. Synchronicity. Yes, totally. So um, Henry was very much, you know, an activist. He was a social progressive who was concerned about eliminating slavery and having rights for women. You know, look at the sisters he had. Another uh, Blackwell sister, Anna, was very involved in social reform as well. And what I liked about it is it's just, you know, I didn't know much about Lucy Stone. And this fictional account of her life really made me admire her so much, in part because, you know, it's the mid-19th century. So her dates were 1818 to 1893. And here she is, a woman alone, going off to college, for one, at a time when women didn't go to college, But then she finds herself on the abolitionist speaking circuit, traveling to all these towns alone and speaking on a very controversial issue where speakers are being attacked. And here she is doing it. I mean, talk about a kick-ass woman who believes in her mission to the point where she's willing to risk it all. Brave. Very brave. So, spoiler alert, she and Henry do marry... But the thing is, she doesn't take his last name. And that's a huge controversy. People attack him, they attack her, and they change the marriage vows, which, you know, traditionally have been to love, honor, and obey. And they admitted the obey part, which also caused scandal. Because, you know, (laughs) a good woman will obey her husband. Yeah, so. And then I was shocked to learn, too, that here it is 19th century. We all of our age anyway, learned in school about how different the North was from the South. But here she is in Philadelphia, going to do this really big talk at an auditorium that she's invited everybody she knows to, including a lot of free black people. And she's appalled to learn that blacks are not allowed inside. She's like, what do I do? I I have to cancel it. And the guy who manages the place is like, well, then you have to pay for the tickets, which she can't do because that would cost an arm and a leg. So it was a big brouhaha as well with some of her abolitionist partners in that field. So, yeah, that was shocking for me to learn, as shocking as probably it was for Lucy Stone, (laughs) although I wasn't, you know, I didn't have skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Great novel. I enjoyed it so much for learning about Lucy Stone. Yeah, another way to learn about history, like we talk about it. So nice to have novels help us with that. It really is. So again, that was Leaving Coy's Hill by Catherine Sherbrooke. This book surprised me that it made my list, but it's something that stayed with me, and it was really about the writing. It's called We Run the Tides by Vendela Vida. Again, she's just a powerhouse writer. Every sentence I felt like, I was like, wow. 
that was a good sentence. <laughs> I'm shocked that it didn't get nominated for any awards. Mm-hmm. It's about Eula B and her best friend, Maria Fabiola. And it takes place in the Seacliff neighborhood of San Francisco, which is a very specific neighborhood that abuts the coastline, thus the name We Run the Tides, because these two young girls actually go out and have ways to bypass this big rocky outcropping based on the tides. And it takes place in those middle school years that are so tricky with young women, especially. So it's very much about female friendship, but there's a mystery that takes place where one of the girls goes missing And I'm not going to say anything more about it, but it's very place specific. You really get to understand that neighborhood. It's very fraught with that young female friendship relationship. And the writing is wonderful. And it's very water based, which, you know, I love water. Again, that was called We Run the Tides by Vendela Vida. I love her name. Yes, Vendela me Vida. too. It's just such <laughs> a nice I need to get flow. that book. I remember reading about it. It was on a list and I just never picked it up. So Great writing, really. Who published that one, Emily? Do you remember? Echo. Echo. Oh, yeah. I love Echo. Yeah. <laughs> she was the editor of The Believer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Founding editor of Believer. Mm. I thought about giving that book to a friend and then I was like, nope, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> so book number two for me is Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. This book actually won the National Book Award this year. And I find it almost darn impossible to talk about this book with any sort of vacuum or any sort of uh, intelligence. All I will say is that it is a book of the moment. So we really have two different stories. We have a young boy we meet, very young age, who gets teased and bullied a lot for how dark his skin is. People call him soot. They Mm. nickname him soot. And his parents convince him that if he concentrates hard enough, he can disappear and he can get away from the situations that arise. Some stuff happens and he truly believes that that could happen and all of the implications of that. The other half of the book is about an author who is on book tour for a novel called Hell of a Book. And he is dealing with his own things, but nationally a young kid has just been shot by a police officer a young black kid and all of a sudden he starts seeing this kid he doesn't know who the kid is but he just winds up appearing and the kid says well you can only see me because i let you because i can concentrate and i can make myself disappear Mm. and this relationship between this author who's going through his own stuff compounded by what's going on in the world along with this young boy teaching him lessons about what he has been dealing with and going through, it just is a cataclysm of emotion and discussion about the world we live in and really holds a magnifying glass to everything that we need to be paying attention to. Mm. And it is just brilliant. So that's Hell of a Book by Jason Moss. I don't know if I did a great job selling it, but I'm telling you, you should absolutely read it. I have a question about it, though. I've heard people say it's a difficult book to read, and I don't know if that means like it's literally difficult to read or it's the subject matter is difficult. I personally didn't find the narrative or the structure difficult, but the topic... Okay. It's yeah. really difficult. Colorism, we've read a lot of novels, I think, about colorism, but I've read a lot about passing. Mm-hmm. I've never, I haven't read a lot about the other side, you know, the, the people who are treated horribly because of how dark their skin is. Mm-hmm. And this book really dives into that and makes you realize just what society has done and how it has framed that within the Black community. It's powerful. Okay. Yeah, it's a gut punch of a book. Yeah. Hmm. And the audio book is, you recommend it's that fantastic. as well? It's okay. fantastic. It's so good. Okay. Yeah. Right on. All right. I have a Librio.fm credit and I'm kind of really holding off on what to get next. So there you go. Maybe that. <laughs> so next up, I am going to talk about graphic novels. Oh, I smell a cheat. cheat. Yeah, no, there's no S. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, okay. I'm going to talk about Wake, the Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Revolts by Rebecca Hall and illustrated by Hugo Martinez. 2021 release from Simon & Schuster. I love this book so much. It's part memoir and part history. And it was about Hall's challenge to research enslaved women who were leaders of slave revolts throughout history. You know, quite often a, they'll just say a woman led the slave revolt and they never gave her name because women were not entities back then, as we know, especially enslaved women. So she wanted to find these women and put names to them. So the graphic novel is about her search to do this, her research, and then as well as some of the revolts imagined how they went down. I thought it was really brilliant and really taught me a lot about the slave revolts led by women and then her own research process. You know, even getting into archives is impossible when it's a private company, a corporation that has archives that don't have to be open to the public, say insurance companies that used to, you know, insure enslaved people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, how much is out there that we can't access was a big question. And then I said S, <laughs> graphic <laughs> novels. I just had a really great graphic novel year. And I think it's because I got an iPad in part, Ooh. you know, I tried to read them before, like on my computer. I just don't really like to read for pleasure on my laptop. Mm, yeah. And then they just don't really work on my e-reader. So I just also wanted to give a shout out to Shadow Life by Hiromi Gato and Anzu. And then also Garlic and the Vampire by Brie Paulson. Two other really great graphic novels. You were going to try to sneak two more books in? Yeah, she just did. I did. I know she did. I did. I just, uh. you know, it's my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, my. And I know Emily always lets me have a pass. That's right. <laughs> Well, my next book is The Paper Palace by Miranda Cowley Heller. This is another debut. I had a very strong debut reading year. It's a novel. This was another one. As I'm talking through my top 10, I realize a lot of them are very place-based. This one took place on Cape Cod over the course of a 24-hour time period, but it covered 50 years. It was so interesting how she did it. It's a love story to both the place because the character spending time on a kettle pond in Cape Cod and also a love story in general. It's about family, intergenerational trauma, infidelity, friendship, and tough moms. I really enjoyed it. Um, Miranda Cowley Heller, the author, is a writer of screenplays and television shows, but this was her first novel. Hmm. And she has spent a lot of time on Cape Cod and you can tell by the writing. It is just all the vegetation of the land and what it's like to swim in these kettle ponds. I just loved where it took place. And then the way that she wove this story, a 50 year time span over 24 hours was fascinating. And also infidelity. Sometimes there's a reason that people do that. <laughs> I love how you just were like, and also infidelity. <laughs> Cape Cod, it's beautiful, the plants, and also infidelity. <laughs> the opening scene of this book is so shocking that you just have to keep turning the pages. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm just so impressed No, by I you. just did one, Chris. I didn't do three for my number nine. Well, you know, when we first started doing lists, Emily was so resistant. And I was like, I it's remember. just a list. Don't worry about it. And now I feel like she's so good about sticking to numbers. And I am not. She hasn't, <laughs> she hasn't seen my third page. Oh. I have said this on my YouTube channel, I don't know how many times, but 2021 was an amazing year for books. Yeah. If you told me I was going to make a top 10 in a year that Colson Whitehead, Jonathan Franzen, Brandon Taylor, Sally Rooney put out books, they are some of my favorite writers and none of their books made my top 10. Wow. Yeah. Just to me, this year has been 
epic when it comes to what's been published. Yeah. Yeah. So Russell, how do you come across most of your books? First, I have a subscription to Publishers Weekly, which comes weekly, as it says in its title. (laughs) And it is my favorite thing to do to make hot chocolate, run a hot bath and read Publishers Weekly and check every book that I'm going to want to read eventually. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's like your scholastic from when you were a kid, right? (laughs) uh, Yeah. And then I just get on my computer and I make a list and then I just keep going from there. I have so many bookish people in my life. I get recommended books constantly. Um, People that watch my channel recommend books to me all the time. I follow a ton of authors and I find you can really trust your favorite authors to usually recommend Mm -hmm. pretty amazing books. And I go out of my way to trying to find the books that people aren't talking about because usually those are the books that are going to hit the hardest for me. So you do a great job of that. I have to say, I will say a lot of the books, three, I think three of the books on my list this year were all long listed for the National Book Award, which to me, this was the best year that the National Book Award has had. I read all of the books that are long listed every year. And I loved all 12 books long listed this year. All of them could have made hmm. a top 10 for some reason or another. So that's supposed to be rambling on. All right. The suspense <laughs> is killing me. Your number one book of the year today. So my number one book of the year is Zori by oh. Laird Hunt. In its essence, it's the story of one woman and her life in rural Indiana on a farm. She's an older woman when the book starts, but she goes back and she tells us about her life, how she got married and how she wound up where she was. She worked for a while in a clock factory with radium, and she um, got a really good group of friends from that, but we watch as the effects of that take place across her friend group and what winds up happening to them. Her husband passes away fairly early in their relationship and she's running a farm and trying to figure out what she's going to do. And she's in this small town and everybody knows her and she knows everybody. And what do you do with that? And how do you create relationship? It's just so good. It's so good. And it's this big, it's literally um, like a hundred and something pages. I think it's one of those books that feels Like it did so much with so little. I often compare it to if you were a fan of Stoner by John Williams. I feel like it's that type of book. Not a lot of plot, but it's really about this person and what they've gone through to become who they are. It's pitch perfect. There's not a wasted word, not a wasted scene, not a wasted moment. And I think you'll love Zori by the end. Mm. And it's just beautiful. The minute I put it down, I said, this is the best book I've read this year and it will not be supplanted. Wow. Now, is it like Gilead? That's a no, question. not. Russell no, knows that's I would not question. say. Um, <laughs> surprisingly, Gilead was probably number 19. Um, not Gilead, Home Okay, was number yeah. 19 on my list. I feel like if John William Stoner... Olive Kittrich and Home had a baby. We get sorry. <laughs> it's just, you know, there's that writing, these people that just are so yes. Elizabeth Strout, yes. Marilyn Robinson, they are just, they are born to put words on the page. And I feel like this was that for Laird Hunt. Okay. I mean, Laird Hunt has other books also, but... um... So I have been shopping. Mm -hmm. I have gone to, I don't know how many bookstores. I have found one Laird Hunt book, which I have bought and I have read, and I absolutely loved it. If you go to the Midwest, you'll find more Laird Hunt. (laughs) (laughs) I guess I'll have to do that just to find (laughs) books. I'm trying to buy them new because I want to support him because I didn't know who he was. I felt like that was a travesty. I'm sure I could probably find them in some new spots, but I'm trying to buy them new, but... No, I've read now two of his books, Mm -hmm. and I have loved both of them. He's a very short book writer. Mm -hmm. Like, his books are not long. I've never read him. I knew of him when I lived in Ohio, and I had a friend that read all of his books. So I can't stop talking about it. It's brilliant. All right, Chris, what's your last one? Oh, my God. Well, while we've been sitting here talking, I just have in the back of my mind that I should have put Melinda Lowe's Last night at the Telegram. Hey, she okay, is. I get at least two oh. minutes at the end of this podcast to throw in my others. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. We're but just I- going to start name dropping at the end. Pat, Pat's going to be like rolling the credits music and we're going to just be name dropping books. It's not on my written list, but I think about it often. Great, great novel. Um, 
So I put dogs. I have a category of dogs. <laughs> Russell's giving me the stink eye. <laughs> Don't even know what this is going to go for. I'm... Well, I have on my list Woodrow on the Bench, Life Lessons from a Wise Old Dog by Jenna Blum. Came out this year, 2021 from Harper. I ugly cried several times reading this book. It's very good. Really good. Yeah. It's about her dog Woodrow and kind of the last year of his life when he's an old dog. How could you even read that? I cry just thinking oh, about what it's I know. about. I know. And I wouldn't have read it had anyone else written it, really. Yeah. Maybe Louise Penny. But uh, I knew Jenna Blum would do a great job of yeah. paying tribute to this dog and being real and And it's hard when you have an old dog who's sick and losing control of things. And, you know, Mm -hmm. when do you do what you do? And so much hope and love. And you will ugly cry reading this book, but I highly recommend it. Yeah. (sighs) And then I also I always tell people they never talk about that part of being a pet parent. They don't. They They always talk about the fun part and the living the life. And then they never talk about the end. And your pet needs you to be strong because they're going to need you to make the decisions for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when my pet, when I have lost pets, I, it has knocked me out for days. So. Oh gosh. Yeah. It sounds fantastic, but (laughs) it breaks my heart just to think about. Yeah. It's a book that you definitely have to be ready for. Mm, okay. Yeah. And then shortly after I read that, I read another dog book, which was all about loving dogs. And that was Dogs on the Trail, A Year in the Life by Blair Braverman and Quince Mountain. <laughs> She's just turned into a cheater. I she did. Hands I down a cheater. A big cheater. <laughs> and I love how she categorized it. So it's like, it's, yeah. it's not, it's a category. It's a category. It doesn't count. <laughs> It's multiple <laughs> books, but I really enjoyed that book so much. It's about their sled dog team, and it takes you through a whole year with the sled dog. So I'll just stop talking now, but <laughs> love dogs. My 10th book <laughs> is Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. The book in this slot changed several times, but this book has stayed with me. I read it in one day during Hurricane Henri when it came this way and we had to, you know, sit on the couch because there was nothing else we could do all day. The story swept me away. See how I did that? (laughs) And it's a novel that takes place in the Scottish Highlands. Again, place, right? I realized maybe because we couldn't travel this year, I was traveling through my reading And a team of biologists led by Inti Flynn has come to the Scottish Highlands to reintroduce 14 gray wolves back into the environment. And the story centers around the townspeople that live there, the farmers, and um, their strong feelings about whether or not wolves should be brought back into their world. And also about Inti and her sister Aggie and some traumas that they've experienced in their life that, as we know, come with you wherever you go. There are themes of climate change. I learned a lot that I didn't know about why they want to reintroduce wolves, which we have done in our country in Yellowstone, and also about why farmers would be threatened by it and have very strong feelings because in the Scottish Highlands, there's a lot of sheep farmers. Also about the drive that someone has to do something that they think is right and what they face when they enter a community trying to do that. I really liked her writing. This is her sophomore novel. Her other novel was called Migrations, which got a lot of good reviews. I think that came out in 19, but I didn't get a chance to read that. So very good. that's my 10th book. Nice. I am so proud of both of you for sticking to 10 (laughs) books. Do you want to tell us your 11th, Russell? Um, yeah, just because it's a debut and it just came out. It's called Beasts of a Little Land by Juha Kim. And it's just set in the early 1900s around the Korean independence movement from Japan's occupation of their country. And it's just the story of two young kids, very different paths that and the effects that making choices in their lives have. One girl winds up being sold into a courtesan's house. And I realize that when I say courtesan, I usually say cortisone and it's not a cream. <laughs> um, but, um, and she uh, follows that journey. And a young boy who comes from the country to Seoul 
and he's poor because his family is all past and he has to make his own life. And what happens? Communism comes in, the revolution against the Japanese, World War II starts, becomes a factor. It travels a long period of time. It is beautiful. It is one of the best debuts I've ever read. Mm. Yeah, it pained me not to be on this <laughs> in my top 10, but well. it may be in tomorrow's top 10. So <laughs> There you go. What about you, Emily? I'm just going to turn to my third page. (laughs) I would just like to say there were a few books that were very close, like Unsettled Ground by Claire Fuller and Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead and Lightning Strike by William Kent Kruger and The Last Romantics by Tara Conklin and The Lower I love The Last Romantics. (laughs) No one talks about that book, Emily. I loved that book. That, that was book in the 10th, and then I took it off. Yeah, so good. What's it about? Tell yes. us. It's about a group of siblings, right? Help me, Russell, because I have to read about books before I talk about them again. <laughs> well, it, it's the first, like, the, it, and one of the siblings, a poet, right? Yes, and that's she's right. reading her, basically her last poem. And it's sort of like post apocalyptic in a way at the beginning. And then you go back in time and you learn about the family. It is brilliantly executed yes and it's all about siblings and birth order and Mm -hmm. how you experience life a similar life but different Mm. yeah it is so good i loved that book yeah i i can't i'm so glad you brought it up because i just don't think enough people know about it yeah yeah and then the lowering days by gregory brown which was another debut but i felt like i was debut heavy (laughs) So I moved it off my list. And I see how beautiful on your list there, too. So I think you've actually mentioned more books than I did now. So I don't feel quite so bad. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. Um, So I have one more question before we let you go on hour two. Do you have any rules or think maybe rules is too strong of a word, but anything you like to do to like start out your next reading year? Like, do you start, try to start with a very specific type of book? So one, I will, if I cannot read a book in the next two, three days, I will not because I will not read a book over a year. So I will start a book on the first and I always start a book that I have been waiting to read forever. Or since I've gotten my channel and I can read books that are coming out in the future, it could also be a book that I have been anticipating reading beyond all belief. Oh, I have um, a guess. I have a guess. I interrupted you. Go ahead. (laughs) That's okay. Um, You're probably right. (laughs) But I often find if I read a book, it's always done well by me. It sets a tone. Mm Mm-hmm. And yeah. it puts me in the right direction. Is What's it, your guess? Is it Hana Yanagahara's book? It is Hana Yanagahara's <laughs> To Paradise. You I will dog. be reading He got this. an early copy. I asked I and did. I did not receive. Good for you. Yeah. No, it came, Doubleday put it in this beautiful box too. It like came in this beautiful box. It's like this uh, apartment building with all these vignettes into different oh it's totally lovely but yes Russell um, I saw you unbox on social media (laughs) but um yeah I mean I'm sure Emily and I could talk for hours about how much I loved uh Little Life Uh, did you read A Little Life Chris no I have not but yeah no that's what I do and I also um always make sure that I try to think about something that I wish I had done different the year before so Mm -hmm. I was just thinking I have no nonfiction on my list this year, which is Mm. weird for me. Mm -hmm. I usually read a lot of memoirs and I didn't read any this year. And that's very strange. So I know I'm going to walk into 2022 wanting to fix that. Mm -hmm. So I'll be definitely trying to do something about that. Nice. So you don't read over the year. I like the idea of that. But that might be problematic for me if I start the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois on Saturday. I have a lot of work to do. (laughs) Oh, no, Saturday. No, Saturday's the first. Saturday is the first. Lucky you. Yes. I keep getting confused this year because the holidays. on. That's right. That's perfect. Okay. I'm starting on Saturday. Is, do you <laughs> think you that's go. a good book for me to start my reading year with? I think it's an excellent book okay. to start your reading year with. All right. What about you, Chris? Do you have any rules about how you start your reading year? I usually like to start fresh, too. I usually don't like to carry a book over from mm-hmm. year to year. So I like to end something. 
And then I'll start new. And last year I started with an Alice Hoffman. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I started the Practical Magic series. Mm-hmm. So I read the first one, and I'm going to do the same thing this year. I'm going to read the next one in the Alice Hoffman mm-hmm. Magical that's perfect series. I usually start with a nonfiction. I usually try to start with like something that's like a good pep talky type of a book. Well, I can do that. I can do nonfiction and fiction. Yeah. Maybe I'll do that. Well, you did just do show your work. Yeah. But awesome that's ending you. the year with yes. one of those. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But we'll see. I have a feeling, ladies, 2022 is going to be another fantastic year yeah. for books. Yeah. I'm super excited. Me so. too. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Now, can I ask you guys a question? I hate to say you guys. Can I ask you both a question sure. about your book club? Have you chosen your books for 2022? How do you all decide what you're going to be reading? We're quarterly-ish. We changed that a little over the pandemic so we could see each other more. Mm-hmm. But um, at each meeting, we decide the next book. So it's an advance in the sense that we're quarterly. You know, we have a few months to read it once we decide. And do you take turns, like, who's going to pick the book? Or it's kind of a consensus? It's a, it's a group effort. Okay. Yeah. And some of it depends on how we're all feeling. Like, I think we decided we wanted something a little bit more uplifting with this next one because we've read a lot of dark stuff. Oh, no, that was our last one. I'm sorry. Because we read the Thursday Murder Club and that was kind of a fun, easy read. Yeah, I think that we all sort of bring titles to the table and um, see where we're going to go from there, right? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, I I can't even remember when we're meeting next. I better start reading that (laughs) book. It has to be around the corner. Yes, our next book is The Sentence by Louise Erdrich. Oh, that's so cool. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm excited yeah. about that. We try to mix it up. We try to make sure that we read something. We don't stay like in one lane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've read some fantastic books. And this will be year... Oh, my gosh. Nine? Year eight or year nine I think that we've been going. Nine. Yeah. I think it's nine. Yeah. yeah. We've been around a while. Yeah. Right. So. Well, this was so much fun. Thank you so much, Russell, for all of your time, all of your incredible descriptions of the books. I want to read every book you talked about. (laughs) Well, actually, one of them I read, Brood. That was it. Oh, yeah. 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 So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having me. I really, really appreciate it. It's always really fun to do this every year and hear what we're all been loving. So Yeah, Yeah. for sure. All right. Well, happy reading in 2022. Yes, definitely. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode. Until then, come chat with us on social media. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, we would love to have you join our community. All of the books that we talked about in this episode are listed in the show notes, which you can find at bookcougars.com. Each book will link to our bookshop.org page where your purchase will help support not only the book cougars, but also independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're an audiobook listener, we do have a special offer from Libro.fm. You can find all of this information on our website. Again, that's bookcougars.com. Thanks, everybody. This episode is edited by Pat Keo Sound Design.